Good. My name is Suzanne Wasserman. I'm the director of the Gotham Center for New York City History here at the CUNY Graduate Center. We are here tonight to hear about Clint Johnson's book, A Vast and Fiendish Plot, The Confederate Attack on New York City. But first, let me tell you about our last forum of fall 2014. It's hard to believe that it's true. Our last forum of 2014 will take place on December 9th at 6.30 p.m. in the recital hall around the corner from here. We will hear Professor Clarence Taylor discuss his book, Reds at the Blackboard, Communism, Civil Rights, and the New York City Teachers Union. The New York City Teachers Union bears a deep history with the American left having participated in some of its most explosive battles. Historian Clarence Taylor recounts a pivotal relationship and the backlash it created as the union threw its support behind social movement, protest movements. Taylor's research reaffirms the union's close ties with the U.S. Communist Party, yet also makes clear that the organization was anything but a puppet. Reds at the Blackboard showcases the rise of a unique type of unionism that would later dominate the organizational efforts behind civil rights, academic freedom, and the empowerment of blacks and Latinos. Without further ado, let me introduce the book and its author for tonight's forum, A Vast and Fiendish Plot, The Confederate Attack on New York City. 150 years ago, Manhattan was almost wiped from the map in what could have been the worst terrorist attack in world history when eight Confederate officers failed miserably to burn down the city on November 25, 1864. So exactly 125 years ago. 150 years ago. Um, had they scouted better targets and made better use of the chemical weapons they carried, firefighters would have been overwhelmed and hundreds of thousands would have burned to death. Tonight we will hear this true story of how New York ignored clear warnings from the federal government about the impending attack and how local, state, and national politicians may have aided the Confederates in the attack. Clint Johnson is a writer living in the mountains of North Carolina who has specialized in writing about little known events in the American, let's see, um, in the American Civil War such as the attack on New York City. He graduated from the University of Florida and spent many years writing for newspapers and business magazines. He's written a dozen books on American history and historical travel. Clint Johnson's book is for sale in the back also, just to let you know afterwards, okay? Thank you, Clint. This is gonna be kind of a complicated story to tell because I wanna, tell you what did happen, what should have happened, and what could have happened. What did happen was not very much. The Confederates were terrible terrorists. They did not uh, accomplish anything that they started out to do. What could have happened was that, what should have happened was that at least half of New York City's population, 400,000 people, could have died. And what uh, could have happened uh, had they plotted out better targets as the entire city of New York could have been destroyed. But first of all, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, what New York City was like at the time. Uh, this is 1864 from St. Paul's uh, near Fulton Versi. You can see down at the very end, that's Trinity Church Spire. That was the tallest structure in New York City at the time. It was also a tourist attraction. It was the uh, uh, Empire State Building of the day. Uh, people would climb up there to uh, go to take uh, to get a good look at the city. Uh, the man that would become Stonewall Jackson, Thomas uh, uh, Jonathan Jackson, uh, took both of his wives up there on their honeymoon to New York City. This is an artist's rendition of what uh, New York looked like. It was uh, just as dense as what you you are used to seeing today. Uh, probably a lot more ships in the harbor. Just to give you an idea, just as New York is today, it was had 814,000 residents, about one-tenth the size of it is today, but that was 250,000 more than Philadelphia, which was the next largest city. Uh, one quarter of the residents were Irish, who had come here after the 1848 potato famine. Brooklyn was the third nation's third largest city, but it was less than a third the size of Manhattan. You know, as of course you probably know, you know, these were all separate towns and separate cities at the time the consolidation of the boroughs had not taken place. And again, Trinity Church was the tallest spot in the city. Manhattan was very prosperous. Now, one thing that is, is, uh, uh, was happening right in 1860 and 1861 as the war was started, the, the, uh, the city's merchants were beginning to worry about that if the war started, there was going to be a problem because uh, the city really did depend on cotton. 
Uh, most of the cotton that was coming out of the South was coming to New York, being loaded on ships, and then taken to across the Atlantic to England. Uh, so there, uh, we're, we're very concerned what would happen if the South did leave. There was a, a Southern politician that played on this. He said if the cotton trade is interrupted, grass would grow uh, in the streets of Broadway. Uh, merchants like A.T. Stewart and Brooks Brothers were filling army contracts. Uh, Brooks Brothers known for its great suits today, but if you've ever heard the word shoddy, uh, meaning poor quality, Brooks Brothers got in trouble with the federal government for taking uh, scraps of cloth, gluing them together, and then making uniforms for the Union Army out of them. First time it rained, these union uniforms fell apart. So that's where the, the word shoddy comes from. Uh, New York ships were, were uh, making iron foundries. As you know, probably the, the USS Monitor was built in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. One thing that might be surprising was Manhattan was very conservative. Uh, it was its political and business leaders had shut down abolitionist talks for 50 years. I ran across a, an account written by the, one of the former mayors of New York that said after an abolitionist talk, one of the city leaders took the abolitionists aside and kind of uh, gave him the Sopranos talk to say, you don't come back to New York City and talk about uh, doing away with uh, slavery or else something bad is going to happen to you. Uh, and it, until right up to Fort Sumter, New York had a lot of leaders that went down and tried to talk to President Lincoln to say, let's come up with a peaceful solution to this so that we do not lose the, the southern uh, trade in, in cotton. But as soon as Fort Sumter was fired on, the city did it, its turnaround, and the city did become a strong uh, Union leader. But Lincoln lost Manhattan's bo vote both in 1860 and in 64 by very significant margins. He lost the city by more than two to one. And one of the ways they did this was all of the city's merchants went to their employees and said, if you know what's good for you, you will not vote for President Lincoln. And so they, you know, they pretty much strong-armed their employees at the time. The nation in the spring of 1864, this is just where we were uh, during the, the Civil War. Uh, U.S. Grant had surrounded Lee's army at Petersburg, and he was really grinding him away. Uh, General Sherman was pushing his way through northern Georgia. But the northern citizens were beginning to see a very large uh, casualty list. Uh, 1864 was one of the, the bloodiest times of the war. Uh, and they were beginning to question the wisdom of continuing the war any longer. They were really beginning to say, uh, why not just end this war? Let's end it under any circumstances. Lincoln himself thought he could be defeated in the coming fall elections of 1864. Uh, he really began to, to uh, plan for a succession plan. Succession plan. Confederates were aware of this, and so they began to uh, take advantage of the Northern discontent. Uh, they didn't believe, particularly the Confederate cabinet, that Lincoln's reelection was not inevitable. So they started to, to say, what can we do to help uh, defeat Lincoln any way we can, since we're not winning on the battlefield? The South is collapsing in on itself on the battlefield. Uh, most Southerners, particularly the Southern leaders, or at least some of them did know that, so they decided we needed a political solution to try and win the war. So they created the Confederate Secret Service, and this was the official name, uh, created in the spring of 1864 with the express purpose of unseating Lincoln in the elections. And it was going to be operating from Toronto, Canada. The odd thing is, the Canadians said, yeah, we don't care. They did not care that the Confederates who were, were fighting their Southern neighbor were operating a secret organization out of Toronto. They just said, as long as you're not violating any Canadian laws, we're not going to try and stop you. It was run by former U.S. Uh, Representative Jacob Thompson of Mississippi. He was born in, in uh, North Carolina, but moved to Mississippi to uh, handle his uh, plantations there. <clears throat> there were several strategies in, uh, that Davis came up with. The, the oddest one was convincing. Uh, he, he got some letters from uh, some copperheads, copperheads or northerners who have southern sympathies in the Midwest saying uh, that there were 250,000 men waiting in the states of Illinois, uh, Ohio, and Indiana to join the Confederacy if only we had some reason uh, to think that we could win. Now this was somewhat true that even in the land of Lincoln, all of the southern counties on the southern Illinois did not vote for Lincoln in 1860. They voted for John Bell who was a, a Southern leading politician. So there's some truth to this, but the odd thing is that Jefferson Davis believed there were 250,000 men in the Midwest ready to join the Confederacy or, or to form a second Confederacy. 
Now, the idea would be that they would form this Northwest Conspiracy or, or Northwest Confederacy that would be in the rear of the Union Army, which then in Tennessee, Mississippi, Arkansas, with the idea that Union Army had to pull back into the Midwest to, to fight this new threat. 250,000 men is three times the size that Robert E. Lee's army ever was. But Jefferson Davis believed this fallacy. You know, it's, it's hard to believe that he could think that whenever he, he couldn't put 100,000 men, Lee couldn't put 100,000 men in the field but, but once, very briefly. So this, this shows you the mindset of somebody that wanting to believe something that isn't necessarily true. Uh, Northwest Conspiracy, uh, this is the shot from Camp Douglas, which was a Confederate prison camp uh, outside of Chicago. Part of this Northwest Conspiracy was that ships were going to sail into Lake Michigan, fire on the, the, the guard posts uh, in, on this camp, and free about 15,000 of these soldiers here. And uh, this is a, a, a fascinating photograph. This is very detailed, showing you what the, the soldiers looked like at the time. And let's see if I can... But I love this photograph. Look at this guy. There's always somebody in every group. <laughs> you know, everybody's serious. They're, they're under, under uh, control. But this guy's having a good time. And he's <laughs> posing for the photographer. Another strategy they thought of was defeating Lincoln politically, electing somebody that they knew would, would be, or that they hoped would be more amenable to uh, signing a peace treaty. So they chose uh, George McClellan. George McClellan had been an early Union general, but uh, he was an organizer, and uh, this guy could not win most of the battles that he was in. He was always very careful. Uh, Lincoln finally said, you know, defeating so they chose the wrong, wrong guy for that. So with no second war front and no friendly Democrat candidate, there was only one strategy left, and that was to moralize the Union's home front by threatening it with the promise of terror. Then the odd thing, and, and I can't figure this out, and I don't know any historian that's figured this out, But it's, it's somewhat the, what Al-Qaeda and ISIS is doing, is they are directly threatening the North, and they're exactly telling the North what's going to happen. On October 15, 1864, the Richmond Whig newspaper published an editorial directly threatening northern cities. And October 18th, look at this, just three days difference, the New York Times got a hold of the uh, Richmond paper, three days' time, and you know, we can't get... The news, or the, the U.S. Mail Service can't get papers to uh, New York City in three days from Richmond today, but somehow they got a hold of this, and they reprinted the Whig editorial without comment on the front page of the New York Times. And this is actually a, a screen capture of that. I'll start reading about the two-thirds of the way up. A million of dollars would lay the proudest city of the enemy, meaning the North, in ashes. The men to execute the work are already there. There would be no difficulty in finding there, here, or in Canada suitable persons to take charge of the enterprise and arrange its details. Twenty men with plans and uh, twenty men with plans all preconcerted and means provided, selecting some dry, windy night, might fire Boston and a hundred places and wrap it in flames from center to suburb. They might retaliate on Richmond, Charleston, etc. Let them do so if they dare. It is a game at which we can beat them. New York is worth 20 Richmonds. Meaning New York is 20 times the size of Richmond. They have a dozen towns to R1, meaning that uh, there's only one, one Richmond, but there's a dozen towns in the north that are the same size as Richmond. They have a dozen towns to R1, and in their towns is centered nearly all of their wealth. It would be immoral and barbarous. This is uh, their uh, this Confederate's version of of being cynical and joking. It is not immoral or barbarous to defend yourself by any means or with any weapon. Directly threatening the North. So was the Whig editorial a signal to the Confederates? We don't know why this editorial was written in the Confederate Whig. Was it a signal to the North, to the Confederates, kind of like a, you know, the, the, the blind box thing that you see in the slide books, or that it was like a person? It's right in the editorial. 
And why would you use the newspaper to send orders? You know, why not just send regular written orders coded to something? And why send advance notice to the U.S. government that something might happen in the near future? Well, the main goal of the Confederate Secret Service by October 1864 is disruption of Lincoln's election and revenge for attacks against Southern civilians. Burning the Shenandoah Valley farms by Custer and uh, Sheridan. This is all going on in October, September and October 1864. The fear that Sherman would do the same in Atlanta and to the rest of Georgia. Sherman, by this point, is in Atlanta, but he's not yet set fire to it, but he, he set fire about everything else he'd come across. So they, they pretty much knew that he was going to do the same thing in Atlanta. So the idea of what Confederate Secret Service settled on was teams of Confederate soldiers who'd escaped from Union prison camps would be assembled in Toronto, Canada. And these were the targets that, that are specifically mentioned. Chicago, Boston, Cincinnati, and New York City which at that time was only the city of Manhattan. And the weapon of choice was going to be a chemical compound called Greek fire. Now, it should, really should be called Byzantine fire, because the, the, the Byzantines were the ones that used it. But Greek fire is spontaneous combustion. According to ancient reports, they still haven't figured out what the chemical compound was. But what you see there, according to the, the ancient text, was uh, flames that are liquid, Essentially, the same thing World War II uh, flamethrowers. It could go out something like uh, 50 to 100 feet and set fire to the enemy wooden uh, ships. They still haven't figured out what it was, uh, 17th, 7th century, but we do know what, pretty much what the Confederates used, and it was a, a mixture of sulfur, pitch, dissolved niter, naphtha, and petroleum kept in small glass vials and cork stoppers. Now, the idea of this is that you throw it down hard on a wooden surface. Is when the air hits it, spontaneous, it flames up, spontaneous combustion. And it does work. I showed this to a, a high school buddy of mine that has a doctor in chemistry from Yale, and he said, yeah, yeah, that'll do it. <laughs> These were the two men selected to lead the New York City attacks. Uh, both of them are 24. They look older than that in these pictures, but they were 24 years old. Uh, Captain Robert M. Martin uh, on the left, and uh, Lieutenant John W. Headley on the right. They were veterans of John Hunt Morgan's Kentucky Cavalry Raids into Ohio and Indiana. They are both skilled horse soldiers, both skilled scouts. Both of these men uh, would ride into behind federal lines and into the towns disguised as Union soldiers, and they would just pick up information from everybody as to what's happening on the Union side and come back. So they went into Canada, and they were specifically recruited uh, by Jackson Davis. This is another thing that we can't exactly pinned down because a lot of the records Confederate Secret Service burned uh, as Rich was uh, beginning to get captured. They burned all of the records for this stuff. So we don't know exactly how they were chosen. They don't know how they were chosen. They were just ordered to come to Richmond and found themselves meeting with Jefferson Davis, the president of the Confederacy, saying, we're sending you to Toronto to help organize the Confederate, or, or to be the military arm of Confederate Secret Service. So they went there for scouting military and leadership. They were not trained spies. <clears throat> now they went about, very, I think it was early October. Now what they, this is pure speculation on my part, they were very devoted to this man. This is General John Hunt Morgan. He'd been mur essentially murdered in Greenville, Tennessee uh, in September of 1864. Uh, he was unarmed, uh, staying at a house when the Federals came, uh, ran out of the house with his arms held up and he was shot now, essentially murdered. And all of his men uh, were vastly devoted to this man, and they were very angry about his murder because he gave up without a fight. <clears throat> they got to, to, to Toronto, and they started recruiting everybody else. And Martin and Henley, they're only two guys that, that are assigned there, and they start picking everybody else. Most everybody else were also write, writers with Morgan, joined the team. But one guy is the outlier, and that's this fellow, Captain Robert Cobb Kennedy. Uh, he was a last-minute choice going on in the mission, and they really wish they had left him in front. Okay, here's what Robert Cobb Kennedy is. Alabama born, Louisiana raised, so you know he had to talk like this, <laughs> and, and uh, he had no business being in New York City. <laughs> he was also a, a West Point dropout. He'd gone to West Point, that problem with liquor. As we call it down south, we call it liquor. 
and if he was washed out for disciplinary, this disciplinary issue, he'd primarily drink. He was uh, hard-headed, uh, hot-headed, and impulsive. He had a, a very memorable, he had a red face complexion. Uh, heavily mentions that in his books. And the guy had a red face, probably from drinking all that. And he also limped from an early war wound. So he, he got wounded at the Battle of Shiloh. So, so now you got a, a slow-talking, southern white boy in New York City that walks with a limp, has a red face complexion. You know, James, James Bond's allowed to spy, because everybody knows he's a spy. They call him by his name as soon as he shows up. This is a, this is a hard drink of James Bond. This, this is not the guy you want to blend into the woodwork when you're coming to burn down a city. But they chose him, he went along. He would be a problem, as we see later. This is where it gets odd, too. There was no prior plot planning in Toronto. <clears throat> One Toronto man, Larry McDonald, knew how to handle the Greek fire. But there's no indication that they practiced with this stuff in Toronto. When you're safe, you think, all right, I'm going to use this chemical compound. I don't really understand. You think they practiced with it. They did not practice with it. McDonald, the guy that knew how to handle it, would not go to New York City. Uh, he stayed behind in Toronto. Martin and Headley did not plan any of this operation. They were just told, you're going to go to New York City and what they would do. Nobody went down to scout out the Manhattan targets. They just showed up. Thompson believed, here we have uh, more stories about how you, you hear something and you believe it. There's absolutely no evidence that you should be believing. Headley wrote a book about the whole attack in 1905. And he, uh, Thompson assured Headley, says, 20,000 men were enlisted in New York. Arms had been provided already for forces in the city. We would be expected to take military supervision of the forces at the vital moment. If all you New Yorkers here, that three of them, you're not going to agree on any one thing. There's not 20,000 New Yorkers that are going to agree to fight for the Confederacy uh, whenever it's losing in 1864. But Thompson believed it, and he tried to sell it to his men. But there are conspirators in New York City. There are several New York City contacts. Henry McDonald, Larry's brother, kept the Confederates' trunks, likely loaded with pistols at a piano store of Broadway. They have not found where that piano store was supposed to be other than Broadway. <clears throat> now, he did not, they did not bring any Greek fire with them. They probably, they probably just carried some pistols with them. Uh, but they, he just kept them at his, at his house. <clears throat> a really interesting guy is somebody I can't, I have not been able to find. He was an unnamed, white-bearded chemist living just west of Washington Square who prepared the Greek fire in 144 glass vials. Now, to back up to this guy for a minute. Whenever I was researching but I went to Washington Square, and from the description in Hedley's book, I actually found the guy's house. It's one of two doors when he talks about going down uh, into the, the, the two or three steps down into this guy's house. Said he, he showed, you know, gave some sort of code word, gave him a name, and the guy gave him a, a bag full of the, the chemicals and went back out. This guy's house is in the middle of where the fire would have burned through. So why is he making terrorist supplies when his own house is going to get burned down in it? Do you happen to know the address and number of the building? Uh, not offhand, not anymore, but if you go to Washington Square and, and go to the, the other side of Washington Square, it's going to be on the right, the first set of row buildings on the right. On the west or the east side? Not on the west side. Okay. And I, I tried to find his name by going through the um, uh, business directories at the time, but oddly enough, they, they did not cross-reference business directories with occupations mm -hmm. at that time, so I was going to try and look for him. Match up the address in Washington. It's not that sophisticated in those days. This is the real key. This is James McMaster, the editor of the Freemasons <laughs> Journal and Catholic Digest. He was the main contact. Uh, he hated the Lincoln administration because they had jailed him for writing anti administration editorials. Ardent Catholic believed uh, that, that people hated Catholics, believed that Lincoln hated Catholics anyway. <laughs> but he wrote essentially the USA Today of the time. Uh, the New York Times was, was only a daily or newspaper that only went to New York City at that time. This guy wrote ship papers to every state in the Union, California, and everything. That's why I call it USA Today. He really shipped these newspapers. He, he had the only nationally published newspaper at the time. Headley 
claimed in his book that two United States representatives, Fernando Wood on the left, who was the mayor of New York City right before uh, the Civil War started, and his brother Benjamin Wood had advanced knowledge of the attack. Some of you might know uh, Fernando Wood on the left actually suggested that New York City secede from both the Union and the state of New York so that it could trade with both the South and the North. You know, this, this guy, pure capitalism at its very base. He said, why not trade with everybody? And so the, the, the city council said, you know, this doesn't sound like a good idea. And so he, he went out of office not long afterwards. His uh, brother Benjamin was a, a newspaper owner, and he wrote uh, editorials for, for uh, very much anti-Lincoln and pro-South. And the, the probably the most remarkable thing was, according to Headley's 1905 book, waiting to help at the uh, New York Capitol was Governor Horatio Seymour. So the governor might have been in on the idea. There were three of the state's most powerful politicians, really closeted Confederates, ready to, to risk death as traitors. Uh, it, it sounds remarkable that two U.S. congressmen and a governor uh, would do this, particularly said that the South is collapsing. Everybody knows this. But... The, the circumstantial evidence is still there. As mayor of New York City in 1861, he said he suggested the city free itself from the U.S. And Wood regularly wrote anti-administration editorials. There's some indication the Confederates might have been sending the money to essentially make advertorials for the Confederacy. Now, what the what uh, according to Headley, Seymour's personal secretary went down to McMaster's newspaper office. Uh, and Headley claimed that what uh, that Seymour would do is essentially not send state troops uh, down to help any insurrection. He essentially would say, I'm not going to call out the National Guard or the state militia. I'll let the copperheads in New York City take over the city and not do anything. And we know Governor Seymour was no friend of the Republicans. Uh, you, you're aware of the New York City draft riots in July of 1863. Seymour came down and addressed the rioters as my friends and told them he would try and stop the drafts of New Yorkers. New York Times at that time accused Seymour of being part of a plot to excite passion against the national government. So we know the New York Times did not like the guy, so he, he's kind of sketchy. We're not really sure. But to get back to the original plot, the Confederates arrived in New York City on October 27th. That was the same day that the Times carried a letter from Lincoln to Grant congratulating on burning the Shenandoah Valley. So imagine these Confederates showing up and they're reading in the, in the New York Times, or probably all the newspaper, uh, this letter from Lincoln, really saying, well, you did a good job in, in burning out the Confederate breadbasket. So they would have really been irritated at that. <clears throat> now, the problem with all of this is the Secret Service was no secret. They could not keep any secrets. As the Confederates left Toronto, two different tips from Union spies warned both the War Department and the State Department of an election day attack. We had two different spies operating. One of them was working for Edward Stanton on the left, and one for uh, Seward on the right. You know, Secretary of War on the left, Secretary of State on the, on the right. Two different spies finding out the same stuff, reporting right away to Washington. <clears throat> Both Stanton and Seward at least recognized the danger, and they notified the mayors of the targeted cities that a threat was coming, and notified the military commanders in those cities. The federal government did what it was supposed to do. They recorded on the intelligence. But what happened was, uh, the New York Times, November 4th, 1864, ran a telegram from the secretary, this is how we know that they weren't, ran a state to the, to the mayor of Buffalo, the, the, the city that is now under snow, right? This department, this is the actual telegram that was sent to all of the, the city mayors. This department has received information from the British provinces, Canada, to the effect that there is a conspiracy on foot to set fire to the principal cities in the northern states on the day of the presidential election. It is my duty to communicate this information to you, signed uh, William H. Seward. All right, now, all apologies to Buffalo. Buffalo is not New York City. That telegram did not appear in any New York City <coughs> newspaper. The people of, of New York City were not warned that the federal government suspected that there was going to be a terrorist attack. No idea why. We do know that local officials did nothing to prepare for any attack that federal intelligence had warned them was coming. 
No advance warning for giving to any businesses. Uh, nothing was done, even the local newspaper. I knew the attack was coming, but did nothing to warn the citizens. Now, I'm speculating a little bit on this because we do know that the New York Times ran that uh, editor or the warning from Seward, <coughs> Buffalo. <clears throat> Henry Jarvis Raymond on the left was the owner and editor of the New York Times, and this is the mayor of New York at the time, Godfrey Gunther. He had to have gotten that, that note, uh, that, that same telegram. They received the same telegram from Seward. We don't Pretty sure Stanton probably sent out telegrams too, but none of those have said service. Why didn't the Times run this? We don't know. But I knew that the Times was not afraid because they had two Gatling guns. Uh, they actually owned Gatling guns. They had their own machine guns that they used to repel the, uh, the uh, uh, New York City rioters in July of 1863. Pretty sure they don't own guns now because the New York Times is very anti gun Uh, General John Dix, he was commanding the New York City District, he recognized the danger and he took the, the telegraph warning seriously. This, of course, is who Fort Dix, New Jersey is named after. Now, one thing that happened to Dix is he got shoved aside. The federal government sent down 3,500 Union troops under or General Ben Butler to New York City, essentially taking over Dix's department, which upset Dix pretty much, this interplay between the uh, officers. Uh, uh, Butler was not, was not very popular in the South. He was the, the, the general that they called the Spoon Butler for stealing spoons, stealing silverware whenever he occupied New Orleans. Uh, also, an incredibly ugly man. <laughs> <laughs> he was also a politician. He was not a very good general. So the Confederates showed, saw all these Union troops coming in, and so they decided on, on their own to uh, wait out the Union occupation of Poles. So they did what everybody else come, does when the New York City got plenty of time on their hands. They went sightseeing. They went down to uh, the uh, Trinity Church. Uh, they listened to all the political, the political season and, and listened to political speeches with that. So they heard all of the political speeches of all the, everybody running for office. Uh, they went and heard uh, uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe's uh, husband, I guess it was. Uh, he was a, a famous speaker. They, they, they did everything. They just decided to wait it all out. But what they didn't do, but should have done, was practice with the Greek fire. Uh, <clears throat> the whole plot from the very beginning is to set fire to the uh, business hotels uh, and, and to set fire to them, hoping that the fires will spread from building to building. Almost everything is wood in those days. They were starting to have what they call uh, fireproof buildings, but they really weren't fireproof. They were just going to uh, set fire to, to the hotel and put the fire spread. Now, one thing they did do, according to Hedley, was they did practice with the Greek fire. They had a safe house in Central Park. And so they practiced by throwing the Greek fire at the board in the daylight, out in the open, in Central Park. You know, what would they have done if a police officer had said, you know what? Tell me what you're doing there, uh, setting fire to that board with this, this thing without lightning? They, you know, these, these guys were not the brightest bulbs when they came to, to uh, doing their business about being spies. What they should have done was scout out better targets than the business class hotels were suggested. And this is when I get out into what could have happened. <clears throat> this is actually some of the hotels. This was the Astor House. Uh, this was probably the most famous hotel in New York City at the, at the time. Uh, this was built in the 1830s. This is Davy Crockett stayed in this house. Uh, before he went off to Texas, and he said that uh, John Jacob Astor must have killed a lot of raccoons in order to build this place. You know, because uh, Astor was one of the he made his fortune in uh, Phelps. This was the Fifth Avenue Hotel. First uh, elevator in the United States was in uh, the Fifth Avenue Hotel. This is St. James Hotel. This was a favorite of actors. And you can see this is the way. This was the city bus at the time. Uh, horse drawn trolley. And this was the Hoffman House. Uh, this painting showing the naked ladies going around a Seder was, was scandalous in New York City at the time. Uh, but that did not, get, no ladies were allowed into this bar because of these naked ladies were being there. And that painting is uh, in a collection in Connecticut now. <clears throat> Confederates, other than got tired of waiting, attacked on Friday, November 25th, around 8 p.m. 
because they did not want anybody to be trapped in their hotel rooms. They actually wrote this. They said, you know, 8 o'clock on a Friday night, everybody's going to be out going to the play. They're going to be out partying, so we don't want to hurt anybody. You know, these are terrorists that don't want to hurt anybody. So this is another strange thing. But to get back to that chemist I was going to tell you about, uh, uh, Headley is not clear on when he went to pick up the uh, actual chemicals, but he said the man handed him a lease, uh, and he and Headley took the lease and he, and he went down. And he says, "I had not thought about how heavy this thing was going to be." So he says, "I start out walking, and I start out walking south." And he says, "I have to put down the lease every ten feet and change hands." Now, isn't this going to attract attention to a, a police officer? And, and remember what I said: they're heading heading south. He's walking the wrong direction. If your safe house is in New York or is in Central Park, so he goes back and gets on the uh, trolley or the horse-drawn trolley to head north to uh, Central Park. And soon he, soon he gets on, one of the corks comes out, and and so he's sitting there, minding his own business, and everybody's, man, somebody cut the cheese. I smell sulfur, and so everybody starts to figure out, you know, why is this sulfur smell? coming from somebody, and so he gets off, and somebody, as he gets off, he hears somebody says, there must be something dead in that police to have such a horrible odor. And so, but here's this guy carrying around, walking the wrong direction, realizing he's got to turn around and head north, and a police officer did not, he did not get attracted to the police officer at that time. So now, instead of 144 vials, we got 143 vials, and that's an important number that we'll get to. <clears throat> On that night, they split up. They had registered in, in these hotels under assumed names. You know, this is about the, the, the closest they came to being spies. Uh, and this is actually a pretty good representation of what they did. They piled up the uh, bedding and the furniture in all of the rooms. They made a mistake, though, in that they, according to Henley, they opened up the court and poured the Greek fire over the bedding and the furniture. I talked to my friend, the, the Yale-educated chemist, he said, Nine. It's supposed, that's, that's supposed to be a sudden exposure to oxygen. So these guys are pouring it out. It's reacting slowly with the oxygen in the room. It's only smaller. So had they, had he, where that bottle is, had he thrown it down, it would have flamed up and it would have started burning. That's what they should have done. 143 vials. They could have started 143 separate fires in New York. This is the location of all the fires. Uh, the furthest north is at Broadway and 26th, and then right one block over is at 5th and 25th, another block on, on Broadway and 24th. Going on down, you can see the fires, but you know, just pure irony, here's where the central fires, most of the fires were set right around where ground zero was. Now this, this one here, was uh, where uh, Stephen Foster died. This is, the, this is a residential hotel, only residential hotel that they targeted. 21 different hotels were targeted all below 26th and Broadway, most clustered around City Hall. One hay barge on the Hudson was targeted. Barnum's Museum was the only commercial building targeted, and that goes back to our old buddy, uh, Robert Cobb Kennedy, who started drinking earlier that night, and uh, we have a saying in the South of, of uh, you know, whenever you're with your buddies and you want to do something stupid, just say, hey guys, what's this? And he threw down a bottle of, of the thing, and it actually did flare up. He did it the way it was supposed to be, and he was drunk to get it in a stairwell. Barnum's men found the fire and put it out almost immediately. <clears throat> Barnum, who you probably know, never let an opportunity pass to promote himself, wrote an ad in the, uh, put ads in all the newspapers the next week saying, See how safe Barnum's American uh, History, American Museum is? The terrorists could not even burn down my museum. The next year, his museum did burn down. <laughs> <laughs> Cries of fire disrupted the play Julius Caesar at the Winter Garden Theater, angering the booths, including John Wilkes. This is the one night that it, uh, John Wilkes Booth, uh, Junius Booth, and Edwin Booth, all three acting brothers, the only time they ever performed together on the same stage was the night that the Confederates uh, attacked. Probably pure chance, but we'll get into that maybe a little bit later. And they were trying to raise money for the 
Shakespeare statue that's now in the Central Park. That was the whole purpose. As the fire started, Police Superintendent John Kennedy, he now knows, man, I should have listened. Those Canadian tips were, were accurate. He ordered officers and firemen to all the broad ways to check the rooms for fires. So they spread out and they started looking for the fires. They started to open up doors and, and they found out, all right, there's a little bit of smoldering fire here. He could have done that before, but he never warned the hotel guys. <clears throat> the city's 4,000 volunteer firemen helped police warn the hotels that they were not needed to fight the fires. Now, that's not, not to denigrate the New York City Fire Department, but the New York City Fire Department before 1866 really did suck. They, they were, this was, fighting fires was a club. Uh, they, they were clubs, they weren't really professional firefighters, it was not organized by the city, it was a social club. You drank beer and caught fires. And uh, if you got to a fire first and uh, you wanted to protect, you know, if you showed up without your equipment, but everybody, you knew your, your own fire team was coming there, somebody else showed up, you sometimes chopped up the hoses of the other firefighter because you wanted the glory of fighting that fire. And you also wanted the glory of fighting it with a handheld pump. You pumped it. They had the steam engine pumps, but what's the glory of standing there just holding a fire hose when you could pump, pump that so that you're a he man? <clears throat> Said, why didn't the fires catch? Needed spontaneous. It was a great fire de defective. They never tested the room, but it was not defective uh, because uh, it, it worked and it should have worked. They just did not use it properly. <coughs> Little damage was done, only one. Hotel rooms suffered any major damage. Most of the fires never got beyond the smoldering stage and they were discovered. <coughs> this is where we get what, what, again, what could have happened. They had 143 bodies. New York City had suffered devastating fires in 1776, 1835, and 1845, in which dozens of city blocks burned all single source fires. All those fires were discovered early, but they still got out of control. 1776, it was a tavern. 1835, a dry goods. 1845 was a whale oil store. I don't think you probably have any problems with whale oil fires any longer in the city of New York, but this was a big problem in 1845 when the whale oil exploded. <clears throat> this is what we get into when I say what could have happened had the Confederates scouted out better targets. When I started doing uh, research, I started wondering what were the better targets. So I went down to the New York Public Library and looked up to the insurance map to see what, if I was going to start a fire, what, where would I start a fire? And I found clustered in days meatpacking and arts districts from 11th Avenue between 20th and 10th Streets. It was a caffeine distillery. Caffeine is kind of a, uh, a lighting fuel, but very volatile. You read, read a lot of stories about this stuff blowing up in houses. A turpentine distillery, turpentine is very flammable. 13 lumber yards, you know, it's hard to imagine 13 lumber yards on successive blocks. Uh, lumber, of course, burning. Wooden warehouses filled with goods on the Hudson. A chem an unnamed chemical factory, just this chemical factory, doesn't say what it is. But the best target of all, the Manhattan Gas Works. Uh, gas was, was uh, brought in coal and you uh, gasified it in, in order to send gas to all of the houses into Manhattan and they would light it and, and light their fires with it or, or light their lights with it rather. Uh, <clears throat> and one of the things in, in those days they could always tell when a hit came to New York City and stayed in one of the hotels because uh, they would always blow out the gas and they'd go to bed and then the gas would continue to go out, kill them, asphyxiate them. And they said at the hotel, as you can see, where they put all the hits because they would have to rip off the locks all the time, so you'd see the doors would be uh, cut up, or they'd be ripping off the locks, going there and get the dead bodies out of the hips and <laughs> asphyxiated themselves. But this is from the uh, from the insurance map showing how big these things were. Now, the fascinating thing about this was I ran across uh, an article that at that time you probably think Connie is charging too much for electricity. There's no way you can use enough that much electricity on your bill. Same thing was going on in the 1850s and early 1860s, that the people thought Con Ed was ripping them off, and so Con Ed said, we'll do a public relations thing, we'll invite everybody down to the Con Ed place, and we'll talk about the 
uh, how dangerous this process is and show all the people how it is. So they essentially gave a terrorist handbook. They said, you know, the most dangerous thing is if, if we, if somehow something happens to these huge water tanks controlling the pressure uh, going out, you could have a blowtorch lighting up in your house. And so this guy wrote about this the, the, and said, boy, you're going, hope, hope nothing like this ever happens. Uh, we don't want anything to happen to these pressure tanks. Confederates did not find that article. If they had blown up and damaged those big, huge water tanks that were controlling the pressure inside the houses, every house in, in Manhattan would have been its own bomb ready to, to be exploded when somebody tried to, to burn it. The uh, Manhattan Gas Works never had its own explosions, but uh, this was quite common around this area. This is part of Connecticut, I think. What could have happened had the Confederates started 144 separate fires, had really 143, had they waited for a windy night, scouted and targeted more vulnerable west side targets, attacked early in the morning when the firefighters would have been home asleep. This is the Croton Reservoir. This is where the New York Public Library is right now. This was the city's main source of water, gravity fed. It was 16 blocks from the first fire. Three hotels closest to the reservoir were all targeted. What if they just targeted those hotels uh, and, and first to get all the firefighters to congregate there to start fighting those fires and then set the other 18 fires further south? There would not have been any more to have fought those fires for the down in the most densely populated area. Fire hydrants at that time, they were all old and, and fed from smaller pipes. They were less useful for fighting fire. The city's 4,000 firemen volunteered, not simply to dispatch to control. Every club dispatched its own firefighters. There was no, nobody, the fire chief of New York City did not dispatch everybody else. These guys were club, they were volunteers, they showed up whenever somebody, whenever their own guys told them to show up. <clears throat> Just love that exertion and competition of pumping the fire hoses. Uh, they're about 15 years behind as far as, as having horse drawn pumps. This is actual New York City fire uh, later on. This is about the 1870, I think. Here's the pump. Uh, uh, you know, actually, uh, wood, wood fire, or a boiler. But here's still the same guys using this hand pump. I couldn't get above the fourth floor. <clears throat> yeah, the aftermath of what happened. Nothing happened. Uh, after that, I wonder what McMaster thought about in his own newspaper. So I went down and read his own newspaper. Uh, well, back up a second. All of the uh, conspirators uh, laid low. The next morning after the fires, that Saturday morning, the, November 25th, um, Martin and Henley went down to the safe, or to uh, the piano store. They were going to go in there and get their trunks. And as they got out, they could look in the window, and there was the daughter of the owner of And then they looked behind her, and there's like six or seven big, big guys, big New York City cops, talking to the owner. And so somebody had spilled the beans. They knew where that piano shop was, and they knew it was associated. So they listened to the girl, and they went on. They had breakfast and said, we got to get out of here from down there on to it. They spent that next night, they went down, they got trained, uh, boarded a train in the dark. Uh, nobody thought to search the train uh, to make sure that they weren't getting out of the, on the train. They did make it back to Canada completely safe. Uh, but the aftermath, I went down and said, I wonder what McMaster thought about uh, reported on this. And this is the guy that, that helped them out. Uh, and he wrote in, in his thing, he did the George Bush uh, Defense. First of all, he says, I think, I think President Lincoln probably started his fires himself because the city didn't vote for him in 1864. I think it was an inside job. And in the same editorial, he said, but if it wasn't Lincoln, I wonder if the Confederates were, were from Kentucky or Virginia. Now, that's a weird thing to say because Kentucky is a Union state. Kentucky never left the Union. Kentucky had Southern sympathies, but they never left the Union. He just gave away that four conspirators were from Kentucky. You know, that's uh, you know, just an odd thing for him to say. Uh, he's essentially giving himself away, but that didn't work. <clears throat> Another thing that really did, pretty interesting happened. General Dix 
ordered troops to chase conspirators into Canada. Nobody told him to. So I just imagine that you got to wonder what, what the Galatians say when he heard, he says, who said we could invade Canada? <laughs> You know, Frank uh, Lincoln sent, sent telegrams saying, we send a Dix's order to invade Canada. Can you imagine what Lincoln's thinking? He says, I'm already got a war fighting in the sword. Now I'm going to have to fight an international war with, with our friends to the, to the north. So before uh, troops could get very far out of New York, Lincoln brought them back. Kennedy secretly sent detectives to Toronto to find the Confederates. He identified all of them with the help of a drunken conspirator. He went to a bar. This is one of these places, one of these bars where Everybody over there is a Union spy. Everybody over here is a Confederate spy. <laughs> he got one up drunk and says, well, which of the guys at uh, Burns Downs in New York? So, well, that guy over there, that guy over there, that guy over there. So he knew all of them. Hit it. Our own, our own troublemaker. He was one of the ones fingered by the drunk. And so they kind of, uh, the New York City police detectives kind of sidled up to him and said, well, yeah, what's, what's he doing? He says, well, I'm going back to South. What I'm going to do is I'm going to ride the train over to Detroit, cross over uh, into Detroit to the United States, and now I'm going to make my way south. So they just, New York City detectives just rode the train with him as they got into uh, Michigan. They jumped him and captured him. He was the only one captured. There was one other guy riding with him. He was at the opposite end of the train car. He jumped out the window and flatly landed in the snowbank. They did not even know he was on board. <coughs> Kennedy's trial was a good travesty. This was in March 1865, the war was still going on. Little evidence was presented by the prosecution. Kennedy did admit he was in New York City at the time. He said, I was on vacation uh, while waiting for a ship to travel to carry me south. You know, what escaped Confederate prisoner goes to New York City on a vacation <laughs> in order to make his way south? <clears throat> but the prosecution did not even call the hotel clerk to ID Kennedy as the drunk he had thrown out of his hotel for loudly defending secession. Kennedy had to change hotels because he got to an argument saying, Hurrah for Jeff Davis and the Southern Confederacy. And that that kind of calls attention to yourself in, in New York City. But, uh, so they made him change, change his hotels. That story came out, but they did not even bring that hotel with clerk in to, to testify. Uh, no evidence to tie Kennedy to the fire, so he did not admit to it. He was tried by a military tribunal. <clears throat> Another great thing about Kennedy, he wrote letters to McMaster. Representative Wood and several other supposed Confederate copperheads. He essentially said, You don't know me. Could you help bail me out from trying to set fire to the city of New York? Uh, and all of these guys got these letters and they all froze up and said, Oh, we never heard of this guy. They were all guys that were good on it because how would Kennedy know to write a letter to James McMaster? You know, he has no connection to James McMaster, has no connection to, to uh, Fernando Wood. All of these guys professed ignorance of him. But uh, he did admit doing it. <clears throat> he didn't finger anyone else. They finally said the night before he was to hang, they gave him a bottle of whiskey and said, why don't you just admit to doing it? And he probably did. He, he said, I, I was there. I did probably burn down the city of New York. But he did not finger anybody else. He did not name anybody else. Did not name McMaster. Uh, he, got, he was drunk when they really hanged him. So, I mean, the guy left his way right up to the end. He was uh, hanged at Fort Lafayette, which is... Uh, West Side Airport is now here in London there is a bridge right across from Fort Hamilton. This was out in the New York Harbor, about uh, several hundred yards out. There's, there's nothing there now. Colonel Martin was arrested much later, but the prosecutors really, all that they could prove was that he was a Confederate soldier. They really did not try and prove that he had anything to do with it. He lived in Brooklyn after the war. He's buried in Brooklyn today. Uh, ran a tobacco export business. Headley returned to Kentucky and served as Attorney General. He was never arrested, and he wrote this book in 1905. I searched every single New York Times newspaper in 1905. They did not even review the book. Headley accuses two New York City congressmen and the governor of New York of being in on it, and they never even talk about it in, in that. I'm not sure why, but they just didn't want to open up a can of worms. One final thought. This is the last slide. And this is another thing that we can't, or I can't figure out. Richard Montgomery was the spy who tipped the War Department off that New York City was going to be attacked in November 1864. He was the same man called to testify at the Lincoln assassination in May 1865 that Jefferson Davis ordered Lincoln's assassination. His testimony was ruled as unreliable. 
was Montgomery right about the attack on New York City, but wrong about the Lincoln assassination? Uh, Montgomery, if that was his real name, we don't even know if that was his real name, disappears pretty much. So uh, we know he successfully warned about a real attack on New York City, but they did not believe him when he said that Jefferson Davis ordered Lincoln's assassination. We don't know that. But that's, yeah, I said it was, it's, what really happened was not much. Uh, nothing happened. What could have happened is that New York City could have uh, burned. And either under what could have happened or what should have happened, uh, it would have been the worst terrorist attack in world history. Hundreds of thousands of people would have died had the Confederates gone through with what they planned to do. But they were not trained. It didn't seem like their hearts were really in it. It was just they, they did it because they were ordered to do it. But, uh, uh, you know, it's, this is a one day story. It appeared in the Saturday papers. Of all the newspapers and where Vast and Kennedy's plot comes from, that was from the New York Herald, I think it was. Monday morning, and you're back to talking about other stuff. Uh, I looked in the New York City Council. They talked about it in one paragraph. You know, your, your, your entire police department falls apart uh, in, in trying to accept warnings from the federal government, and they don't talk about it again. Now, a lot of things just are, are seem pretty weird to us today. You, you know, you, that would have been a big city council thing if the same thing happened today. But one day story in the newspapers and the city council doesn't seem to be a Answer any questions? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, did, um, we know that Lincoln suspended Kennedy's corpus and did stuff like that as a yes. former president. Did he react in any way to this, such as suspending Kennedy's corpus or having people arrested? For um, did, did he react to the plot itself? Yeah. Anyway, no, I, I never even thought to, to find out what, if Lincoln ever commented on it. Uh, good point. Yeah. Oops, sorry, read that. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to ask a question. I'd like to ask you what inspired you to write the book. Well, I'm going to say I was always looking for different things to write about. So I've written a dozen books on the war, and I like unusual or little known uh, aspects of the war that involve people. And I'm not a, a, a trained historian that, that's going to say the 26th North Carolina Regiment went out 200 yards and, and fired it in an oblique direction, and and then the the 24th Michigan attacked them from 50 yards away. You know, that doesn't interest me, but the interest, the stories of, of that interest me. So I was looking around, and there's been only one other book written about this, and that's been was 20 some odd years ago. <clears throat> they concentrated on Robert Cobb Kennedy, but they did not look into the background of, of what could have happened to the city. And so that was what really interested me, is what could have happened to the city and didn't happen to the city. Mm -hmm. So it was just the, the idea of finding the story that, that had not been recorded before that really got my attention. Yes, ma'am. Do you think the reason why there was so little coverage in the papers afterwards was that the authorities didn't understand how drastic it could have been, or did they try to muffle it so that the public wouldn't be alarmed? Well, I don't think there was that much of a connection between the authorities and the newspapers. I don't think there was an intentional uh, attempt to, to shut it down. But I don't think journalism in those days wasn't the same as we have today. There didn't seem to be a whole lot of investigative uh, journalism going on. And uh, they pretty much just, just wrote about it and moved on to something else. Now, in, in trying to research what happened to Kennedy, now the federal authorities would not allow any uh, newspaper coverage of that. It's really the only way you can find out what happened to Kennedy is reading the official transcripts. His trial was completely conducted in secret. So they did shut down any any attempt to be open about that. Uh, it's, it's, it's just one of those things that I, I don't think that the, the writers at the time uh, and the newspapers at the time I realized how serious it was. But that, that you just reminded me of something, though, that, that <clears throat> there was a quote from uh, one of the New York City chiefs of police that, that, is, that is kind of telling. He says, you know, it had to have been Confederates that had, because one of the speculations was that, that this was done as a diversion to try and rob a bank or something like that. They said maybe it was a diversion. And a, a New York City police chief says, it probably was Confederates that did it, because our, our criminals in New York City would have done a much better job <laughs> of breaking the threat of the city. But, so he said he, he really believed it was Confederates. So. Did the police understand how drastic it could have been? Uh, 
Uh, they said at the time, and, and it, 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 it does make sense, they said, had they, the Confederates left all the windows down, and they said, well, but probably what saved us with Providence at that day was a chilly night. Uh, and, but there's enough oxygen in the room to, to set off a fire. So they, they misunderstood the, the value that what could have happened. You know, they kind of said, well, it was lucky the windows were down or else it would have been worse. So they did not understand how dangerous the Greek fire was. No. Uh, because certainly there's enough oxygen in, in a room. Had, that, had they used it correctly, it would have set that room would have gone up pretty quickly. And all of the, you know, all the hotels were all wood. And they, even the so-called fireproof buildings were cast iron on the outside. But you got Wood, wood on the inside, once that cast iron got hot, you know, it would have set fire to wood on the inside. So they, they were really, there was nothing that was fire safe. Yes, sir, back. Were there any confessions obtained from the attackers? <clears throat> only Robert Kyle Kennedy. Mm -hmm. um, only Kennedy had his, when he didn't admit to it in his trial, <coughs> only on the, the night before that he was going to be hanged, did he admit that he really did do it. Uh, but he did not finger anybody else. He, he refused to. And, 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 and I guess to, to maybe the, the implication, maybe the city of New York wanted to forget that this had happened because they did not, they arrested Robert Martin and kept him in jail for a year. But they really didn't try very hard. The, the only thing they proved was he was a Confederate soldier. And the judge, the case is, hell, everybody was a Confederate soldier in the South. They, 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 if he wore a uniform, he was a Confederate soldier. He said, I'm going to kick him loose. You haven't proved anything. And the prosecutor said, yeah, okay. So you had the guy that led the mission. You had, you had essentially the Bin Laden. You had the guy that, that led the mission, that they knew who led the mission, that they were not willing to, to really investigate and prove that he, that prove that he led the mission. Uh, yeah, it's just a, a weird thing. Maybe they just wanted to forget all about it. Nothing had happened. You know, nobody, nobody got killed. When the um, when the Germans blew up that town, it wasn't it was kept quiet as well. So maybe maybe that's why we that's why they kept this quiet. That it was just the attitude that they had at that time. It, it could be. If, I mean, I could not find very many uh, any hidden memoirs or anything like that, that where these people uh, talked about, boy, did I screw up this one? And, and uh, uh, it's just glossed over, forgotten about. You know, whether it was just the times or whether it was an intentional cover-up. If it was an intentional cover-up, they did a good, very good job because there's no, no trace of it. Uh, but what, what I really find remarkable is that the New York Times and none of the other newspapers wrote about it in 1905. You've got a book coming out that, that, that says two United States congressmen tried to burn down their own city, and the governor of New York tried to help out burn down the city of New York. And you think that the New York Times would have, would have tried to say, well, this didn't happen, or, or, or where's the real proof, or, or would have tried to discredit it. But no, no mention at all. You know, I, I read through all of the accounts twice. Uh, because I can't find exactly what month the book was published, so I read it all. I read from all of 1905 and what, the first three or four months of 1906. No mention of this book at all. So was it distributed in New York? Uh, nationwide was distribution, so you know it was it was a you know, very well done. You know, this was the time when all, a lot of memoirs were coming out, both Union and, and Confederate sources. So I'm sure that it was it, it would have been covered in some fashion, or it would have been known about. It. Yes. Sir. Uh, other than. Uh, Kennedy's Gallup confession and Nebby's book half a century later. Uh, were there any other confessions by any of the other conspirators or any other man manuscripts or nothing else? <clears throat> Not that I could find. Uh, Martin never admitted to it. Uh, well, Martin, Martin, Martin did, you know, he, he did admit to it. Yeah, he was, he was it. So, uh, but he did not admit to it in, in court. No. Right. Well, he, because he never really went to court. He was, uh, the, the court, I couldn't find real detailed court papers on him. Uh, but the, the prosecutor, just said, you know, if you're not going to be willing to prove anything, and, and he's not going to confess anything uh, in court, then I'm going to kick you loose. That's, uh, that's what he did. And he came and, and uh, it came to Brooklyn, and uh, uh, he actually came back and he, and he 
came for a, uh, he was wounded during the war, and he died coming back here uh, to try to fix that wound. He, it was a lung wound, and he, he came up here to find a surgeon that was trying to fix him. He didn't die on the operating table, but he, he eventually did die. I was, I'm just kind of ironic that he, he uh, died in one of the places right across the river, or river where he's uh, trying now, to fix You just said that he never admitted to it in court. To go back to this question, so what is the evidence, the documentation that he never did confess? Uh, well, well, he talked to Hitler. Yeah, he was a source in Hitler's book. Yeah, there was yeah, no, no confession to any officials, but he did do it. You know, he, he made no secret of doing it to, to anybody else. You know, it, he was not pursued uh, after the court case was thrown out. You know, they just didn't care. Now, some of the other conspirators, they pretty much all disappeared. Uh, since they were, uh, one of them, we only know his last name, <clears throat> which goes back, you know, another a good point is that uh, eight of them showed up, six of them participated, two of them did not show up. One of those guys probably went to the police and said, here's what's happened. Because that's the, that's the my speculation is that's the only way that they would have known to have gone to the McDonald piano store. He had to have told them uh, that this this guy's participating, and in yeah, that's right. And in Kennedy's or uh, Kennedy's trial, that guy shows up to testify against Kennedy, and Kennedy's sitting there, and, and he said, "Uh oh, there's there's the guy that was in on this with me." Kennedy does not acknowledge him because even in his drunk uh, liquor out of mind, he would have said, "If I acknowledge him, then I'm also admitting that I did it." So he did not acknowledge him, and he was not. He did not finger him. So that guy was in on it because that guy did not show up. That guy was either a double agent or he just chickened out and went to the police. So that's the only way they would have known about the McDonald piano store. Uh, yeah. Did something happen to McDonald? Uh, no. no. The only guy tried for this was, was Kennedy. Uh, yeah, McDonald's. I mean, McDonald's. McMaster. McMaster. McMaster, when you read his testimony, uh, and, and all of the court records are preserved for Kennedy's trial, McMaster's a glittering idiot. On this, I mean, he has is, is lost it. You know, he's just saying, just stringing statements together that don't make any sense. And I think the prosecutor said, you know, this guy's not making any sense at all. But, you know, there's the, the, the evidence that all of these guys were connected to Kennedy was, was his letters to them saying, can you help me out with some bail money? And uh, none of them did. There's just no way he would have known any of them. Uh, you know, the guy's a, a, a lieutenant in the Confederate Army out of Louisiana. And there's, there's no way he would have known any of these people unless they were on the list. That was another thing to show you how, how uh, nonchalant these people were. When they first showed up <clears throat> in New York, they went down and had a meeting at McMaster's office. In those days, you didn't have private offices. You just had a desk. So what did McMaster's editorial employees think when eight men, all of a sudden exits, come trooping into his, his, his office to talk about it. You know what? I think that would have attracted attention. You know, all these guys from Kentucky, and you know, Kentuckians talk with a very specific sort of uh, accent. And, uh, uh, and, that, and his office was also across from a police station, too. So, so you, you'd think he would have sent out a coded message that says, you know, let's meet by Big Oak Tree in, in Central Park at midnight. You know, no, 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 they walk down and at noontime into, into an office across the street from a police station to talk about a plan to, to burn down the city of New York. Um, what was the reaction like in the Confederates? Or is there any record of those kind of these reactions? It, there was not really much at all. I mean, it, it, there was a, a, a few references to it. But again, it said nothing really happened. Yeah. You know, it, it was only a minor, a minor fire in a minor hotel. So, so there was... They, you know, if you're, if you're saying that if there was any newspaper that said, yeah, we tried to burn down the city of New York and we failed, there was, there was nothing like that. Where was Kennedy prosecuted? Was it a military court or a state? A military court? tribunal. Um, uh, and it all took, you know, he was, he was kept, uh, I forget the name of the street. The, the, uh, I, I went looking for the building, that building's not really there. Uh, down in the, the lower Manhattan area. He was kept in jail there and then transferred to Fort Lafayette. 
and the whole trial took place there. It was strictly a military tribunal. So again, civilian, uh, he wasn't in the Confederate, <coughs> excuse me, not in the Union Army, uh, but he was tried by a, a military tribunal, where, you know, so that was legal or not. Enemy uh, come, combat. Yeah, 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 that's what they, they, same theory that they were using then. But when you, when you read it, they, it's, it, it was a travesty. That just no evidence was presented against him. They just knew they had him, they were going to give him. And, and the trial wasn't mentioned until after he was hanged. Uh, he actually, uh, when he was hanged, he was singing an Irish drinking song when he, when he died. I mean, the guy wiped his liquor, I guess. Say, say that. He, he wasn't a, and, and, and the, the jailer just kept him pumped up. You know, he, was, he was probably drunk for the whole time he was in prison. Yes. So what, what makes this a, 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 a terrorist attack, not an act of war? Well, this is a target for civilians. Uh, you know, I, I consider a terrorist attack as any time you target civilians uh, and, and, and not military. You know, if they tried to go in and bomb uh, General Nixon's office and they're trying to set fire to that, that, that would be a legitimate military target. Uh, but they they uh, tried to target civilians in, uh, uh, in a hotel. Uh, you know, they, they, the, the fact that they tried to do it at 8 o'clock at night when everybody's out partying it is a strange aspect about for, for terrorists to think about. So. Yes, ma'am. Did Sherman turn Atlanta after this, and was there any No, it was before. Before. Uh, he, the, the fire started uh, in... Um, uh, about the same time, though, that in October, and then because then he, he went down, he was in uh, Savannah by Christmas time. I'm not sure of the exact date when the fire started. I think it was in October. So uh, I think they might, they probably were not. Let's see now. Uh, it would have been early November. So they, I doubt they would have been aware of it. But they might have been. Please buy the book. It's seventeen dollars. Thank you very very much. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I, I have not watched that. Somebody told me about it, and I just heard it. It's a British production. Yeah, it is. And, I, and actually, I found it, they, they actually quoted me on their website, but they, they never told me the, 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 the comment of it. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot. Thanks for coming out. And bye. Are, are you a German? Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay.
my man blood type stuff. And he was sitting there, we'd, we'd pick up the pedal just and she'd, she'd tell us what it said. And she says, hey, it's still stuck. I can't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've actually uh, had, um, in my experience, and I've had a couple in my life now, uh, I, uh, I was seeing somebody who worked in a good department for a while. We'd have these conversations like, yeah, I can't tell you. And she's like, I can't tell you. And I'm like, oh, I guess it's really my conversation. <laughs> Thank you both so much. Um, how long are you all here for? Yeah, I'll leave tomorrow. Uh, enjoy your cold and blustery night. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much again. Thank you. Yeah. Take care. Mountains of Nashville. Yeah, Matt and all of them still. Are you still in school or just 